Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm very excited to have Jennifer Brown join us. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Michael. So Jennifer, today uh, you run a multi-million dollar consultancy working with clients like Adobe, Coca-Cola, Samsung, Starbucks, Hilton, Google, Novartis. I'm running out of breath. Like There's just so <laughs> many, but many Fortune 500 brands that uh, people listening right now are watching this uh, would be familiar with. I, I want to get into that. I'm, I'm really interested in hearing your story of how you got into kind of building the business, but I want to start before that. So kind of take us back to the beginning, because if I'm not mistaken, you were an opera singer. Is that I correct? I was. I know. How did I get from there to here? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> take, take, take us through that. So I think okay. you, you had some injuries, right? Vocal injuries or otherwise. So just kind of walk us through what, what that life was like, because except for listening to a bit of opera, um, you know, every once in a while when I get into the office here, um, didn't introduce us to that world. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a crazy world, um, and it's as it's as difficult to make it in that world as they say. I guess I had to just figure that out on my own, though. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I through the course of training, I injured the voice, um, had to get a couple surgeries, mm -hmm. and had to ultimately reinvent. And what I like to say is, I was I was kind of pulled along by ex performers who loved being on stages but had translated into the leadership development world. And I didn't know that that was a thing at the time, but I followed their lead. And I ended up getting a second master's degree after my vocal performance degree in organizational change at Fordham University here in New York. And um, I really found my passion and my calling. I loved the work, it was so humanistic. I loved facilitating a lot, obviously, because as a performer, that's a comfortable place for us. And, um, but I also learned about the ins and outs of organizational change and effectiveness and leadership and team development and group dynamics. And it was, <coughs> it was so eye opening. And, and so I ended up getting uh, an HR roles in a series of corporate environments. And I thought maybe I'd be ahead of learning and development, but I got laid off at one point and I said, you know, I think I want to be external. I think I want to be a consultant. I read Peter Block's book, Flawless Consulting, which I'm sure everybody on your podcast knows about. And it was, it dawned on me, I could get my expertise utilized in this way and um, be super creative with it and get paid to do it. And um, that just like ignited everything. So I started my own company. I, um, <coughs> excuse me, I, I hung on my shingle, got my first couple of clients, started to build my team and found this kind of niche in this corporate consulting world with leadership yeah, I'm development. I'm going to jump in because I think we're, we're getting, we're there, there, you've covered too much ground. I want to <laughs> give you a moment to uh, you know, have a little okay. sip of water if you need, but let's, let's peel that back yeah. a little bit. So when you made the transition from the, the opera world, right, in, you, met, you said you went out and got kind of uh, another degree. Was that where you started to develop your, your skill set around kind of organizational development? Or was it actually when you... Uh, were in the the workforce and doing the facilitation that you developed it as part of that? That's a great question. I mean, you learn the theory in the classroom and actually our program was taught by working consultants. Mm -hmm. So they literally brought in their contracts with clients and we would use that as a teaching tool so I could actually see how do you, you know, use the concepts that Peter Block talks about? Like, how do you construct the relationship? How do you put the boundaries? What's a statement of work? How do you price for your services? So that was a huge um, aha moment. And I think then the application of it was when I then subsequently would become a trainer and I delivered one year over like 200 programs and soft skills. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, like the meat on the bones of how this actually is talked about in the classroom. And how do you facilitate adults through the process of talking about like learning how to lead or manage teams or manage time? I taught 20 different topics. <laughs> uh, and then, but then I think that, that becoming a consultant was a, yet another leap from being a trainer. So trainers deliver programs, but facilitators like are curious about the dynamics in a group. <coughs> were you, were you working me. internally, like as parts, were you <coughs> at the time when you were delivering the 200 kind of, you know, sessions a year? I was actually a trainer for hire. Okay. And so I worked for a small training company that designed all the programs for me. Right. And then I would go forward and deliver them. Okay. So that's really interesting, right? Because a lot of people find themselves in, I think, similar situations <laughs> where, um, and feel free to grab a, a sip of water there. Thank if you. you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I'm, what I'm wondering is, you know, it, essentially it's almost like you're a contractor, right? To a mm -hmm. degree, it's, you're not having to do any of the business development. You're just getting the clients. You just show up, you deliver, you get paid for it. Uh, a lot of people feel that they, you know, they call themselves consultants, but essentially, you know, they might be doing consulting work, but they're really working more like a contractor. They don't have a business. They have 
their expertise that they're, they're delivering. And you made that shift, right? From delivering your expertise to actually deciding to, to build a business. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what was going on in your mind. Why did you decide like what, what made you think, yeah, you know what? I don't want to maybe rely on just one source of business or like, what was it that made you do go out and build your own business? Yeah. I, if you had asked me before I built JVC, like if I wanted ever to be the boss who's responsible for everything, I would have said no way. You know, I just want to go in and deliver, deliver, deliver and have somebody else administer the work, sell the work, invoice for the work. And I was just the talent. And yeah. I loved being the talent for a long time, actually. And that was where I actually cut my teeth, honestly. Mm -hmm. It was like 10 MBAs in the space of a couple of years. Because once you're in these corporate classrooms enough times, you're like, you become really knowledgeable. You know exactly what people are going to say. Yeah. But I think, um, I think uh, what happened is I got this giant client of my own. And I stopped subcontracting. Mm -hmm. And I LLC'd. And um, I, I thought to myself, I've got more work than I can handle and service. And I didn't want to say no to the work. And, you know, so and I started to get that first client. The, the oh, your, it was oh. actually, it was a family connection. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, it was just a, a next door neighbor of, of my sister who worked for, um, I'll say who it was. It was Cisco Systems, which, yeah. but it, what a first client to have. Sure. And they said, hey, I have a team in supply chain. Um, we're all over the world. We do offsites all over the world four times a year. Would you come and be our team development and coach mm. person. And I said, yes. And he said, can you get on a plane in two weeks? And he said, um, you can teach them anything you want. I just, here's my goals. Here's where I need them to develop. He gave me the rundown on each leader. He talked about the team and I literally could take this group and teach whatever I wanted, structure the program. And I had them for two days in the classroom. So it was just incredible. It was training, but I was designing it. I was delivering it. I was managing the relationship. I was doing all that stuff, but I was a team of one. So everything was my responsibility. And you know that that's not scalable. You can have like 10 of those and you're literally out of bandwidth and running all over and you know, it's not productive. Yeah. So How did you um, price that project. I mean, it was your um, first piece of business that you were running yourself. There was no, yeah, you know, yeah. no kind of middle person there. So how did you decide what the fee should be for that first project? Well, I knew what I had been paid as a subcontractor. Okay. So I knew how much I was being marked up in the mm -hmm. previous scenario. Yep. So I basically took what I had been paid and like tripled it and did mm -hmm. that markup. And then I counted the number of days I'd be in the classroom plus days for prep. Mm -hmm. And then by the way, traveling to Asia and Europe and all, you know, do you charge for travel? You know, I think what I did is kind of roll an amount together that I felt would cover all that yeah. um, and then put that price in front of them. And at the time um, they had these like incredible deep pockets. I was so lucky they didn't blink. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah. I was off and running and uh, yeah, that was, that was the aha moment for me to say, wait a second, it maybe it wouldn't be so bad to run the company and not be the one in the classroom. And that was subsequently what I would then build. Love it. Okay. So now let's get into some, some more fun stuff. So you got the first client, right? That that's going well. Um, it gives you some insight into what things potentially could be like for you. You mentioned you went ahead and built a team. Obviously it's grown considerably since then, but talk to us about how did you go from having that first client, which obviously is a well-known brand name to going out and getting your second, third, fourth, fifth clients. What did you do to, to start ramping things up? Yeah, I knew that having a client that was responsible for 80% of your revenue is never good. I know I've, I've been paying attention. Yeah. So, uh, so, but what I did is I leveraged my relationship with them to write some white papers and some thought leadership. Um, and some of which are still out there. You can actually find, we did a paper on employee resource groups in the diversity space. Um, and I also presented a lot with my clients at industry conferences. And so mm -hmm. Um, I think for new consultants, you're trying to build your legitimacy and your credibility and these really big companies that you have contracts with that love you, you should tell that story because that's your most powerful marketing you could ever do. So I, um, we kind when, of did- When you say, sorry to jump in, but when you say tell the story, kind of make that a little bit more tangible for <clears throat> what, what do you mean? What should they be thinking about when you say tell the story? Well, I think if you have a client that loves you, that loves your partnership and what's coming out of it, you should use that as a, a marketing um, vehicle to present, for example, to panel ideas to conferences where you talk about, it's literally a case study of what you've accomplished together. Yeah. And so you're literally in this teaching mode of not only we, did we do this work, we had these great results, but we're now going to use it as a case study to teach to the industry. Mm -hmm. So you're giving back, but you're doing it together with the client, which is cool because um, then other clients in the audience see you and say, well, we want to work with Jennifer. I mean, 
clearly we want what they have. Yeah. And so it just went like this way. And I also moderate tons of panels. I would always do that for free. I'd always offer to conferences like, hey, like sign me up. And I remember I had um, Toyota and Genentech on one of my panels once on generational diversity. Neither person I knew and both of them ended up becoming clients mm -hmm. just from one panel. Right. And actually continuing to be clients and friends like all these years later. And um, mm. it, we, it all started in a conference setting, which I'm such a fan of conferences for the best marketing you can ever do. It's like, to me, the easiest lift. Um, but being seen in front of audiences with potential current and potential clients, having a strategic conversation, um, it just plants the seed in people's minds. They say, who was that person that helped that company? And they were talking, maybe we should give them a call. And one thing just led to another. And my follow-up, I follow up all the time from conferences. I literally like get business cards and, you know, ask people if they'd like to stay in touch. And so we built our mailing list that way as well. So okay, well, why don't we, you know, I was going to ask this a little bit later, but why don't, let's just jump into it right now. Tell us more about the, the conference side. So this is, mm -hmm. it sounds like this is probably your, your go-to marketing you know, strategy or, or kind of what you employ to generate leads and inquiries. What does that look like? If you kind of just break it down to steps, how do you approach, of course, anyone can just attend a conference, yeah. but there's a lot of people who go to conferences and don't walk away with, with leads. So True. what are you doing specifically that's working so well for you? Um, you know, for you to say that conferences are the go-to. Yeah, I think, well, I believe in giving back to an industry um, contributing back. So that means thought leadership. That means, you know, going the extra mile, not getting paid to tell the story, right? Because you're, you're giving back. Um, I prepare really well. I never go to conferences really where I'm not presenting, honestly. Like that's, okay. so that's the key. That's it's, it's where you, where you can be visible. You're, you not have walking to be visible. The, you're not walking the halls and just taking <laughs> notes and no. grabbing a coffee and no. you're, you're there center stage, or at least in front of a lot of people. And, and how do you think about which conferences to, to go to? Are there certain characteristics or criteria that you use to decide whether or not you're going to try and be on a panel or speak at a conference? Yeah, it's funny. There's a big difference between entrepreneur conferences I enjoy, but they're not helpful for my business. So, right. so it's all about the audience and yeah. it's literally putting yourself to swim in the same pool as the people that you want to hire you. Mm -hmm. So I use that criteria. I, um, I also notice who of my competitors, where are my competitors speaking? Where right. do my clients gather? Where do they go so that I can make sure that I apply, by the way, six months earlier when they do the call for speakers, you have to be yep. really organized. So my team mm -hmm. maintains a spreadsheet and we, we literally get those applications in. And we also um, pitch a lot of creative ideas. Like it'll be my keynote and then there'll be a panel on this emerging issue or a panel with other leaders on this, um, this emerging issue. So sometimes we'll pitch like three or four ideas with different combinations of clients and people in my network. Yeah. And then the organizers will give the green light to usually one or two. And what if someone's listening to this and going, okay, well, Jennifer, this works for you because you've done it for a while. You know, you've written the book, you got these big name clients. Take us back in time if someone maybe doesn't have a very well-known brand right now as, as a client, but they're doing well in their business or whatever, they might, might be even getting started, what would you suggest to them as a way that they could actually start getting, getting into conferences, being on panels or, or speaking at them? Yeah, so you always know, you know one or two friends, I think, that share maybe a passion around um, something that's not being covered in an industry, right? right? So what would make your message unique? And mm -hmm. it can be a case study or it can be like academic research or it can be like a workshop that you build. You know, I've built a ton of stuff for conferences and run it, you know, for the first time. Yeah. Um, conference attendees are always willing to learn and they really want to like, they want to play, they want to be interactive, they want to network with each other. So I find it to be a really energizing audience to pilot things with. Um, I also would say cozy up to the organizers. So always know the head curator of conferences if you can. And and you earn that, by the way, by going to the conference and kind of finding that person, introducing yourself, you know, putting yourself in front of them and then applying perhaps the next year so that they have a name with a face. So unique value proposition, make it interactive, solve a curator's problem. Every conference organizer is always mm -hmm. trying to make sure they're kind of covering the industry. And you know, if you bring up something that you've done your homework on to say, you know, I don't see a lot of speakers on this or on this, like, let's do something, let's put something together. Um, you know, that can get you in the door. Really good. That's awesome. Um, so let's now go back. You, you were, you landed kind of your first client, then went off and, and got the next few clients. At what point did the business model change for you? Like at what point did you decide, okay, we're, we're delivering the, these trainings 
uh, but I want to go like beyond that. Did you, when did it change to a different format or, or how did you actually start kind of scaling the business? Yeah, I tried for many years. Um, I, well, first of all, the what, Cisco what you, client. What did you try? Tell us about that. Yeah, the Cisco client said to me one day, you know, you don't have to be the one that comes and delivers. You oh, can send somebody right. else in. And right. I was like, what? <laughs> so that was the seed. I was like, oh, yeah. okay. So now I'm going to start working on the business, not in the business, like I often say, stealing that from Emith. Um, and I can then focus on marketing and sales right. and building relationships and thought leadership and our brand. So I started to send people in. I started to hire operation staff. So I always had a CFO, COO. I had a marketing assistant. So what media stage people. was that? Like kind of where, where were you in terms of number of people and revenue when you start to bring on those more strategic yeah, roles? Good question. Uh, I would say, I think if your revenue is like 500 grand, you have the wherewithal, unless you like need to pay yourself, you know, the bulk of the fine, you know, that can be your choice. But for me, I paid myself and I always like underpaid myself, I'd say, which is probably not good. Um, but I did. And I took every cent I had and put it towards team. So I put it towards people who would build the processes and systems behind us, get people paid, yeah. um, do contracts, things that I wasn't good at. I knew I needed to make sure I had people doing. And I started with part-time people. It wasn't always full-time. It was not employees. It was just 1099s. You know, so I built, I started to have like two, three, four people, I'd say in those early days. And then when you cross a million, you can start to have a bigger team. You know, you can start to have maybe seven or eight people or maybe even more depending on if people are part-time and full-time. Um, and then the team kind of switched over the years. I ended up, so I have client facing consultants who are always 1099s because they've got other projects. I still have that today. They're professors. They are deans of colleges. Like they have, they're kind of splitting their time and they love that. And I love that. Like mm -hmm. I want them to be in the world and having that variety so that when they do work for our clients, they're, um, yeah. they're fresh, they're current. But sure. then I have like a whole infrastructure team right now of senior people and junior mm -hmm. people. And the senior people are really critical because they're the ones that, like manage the business, the consulting business. So I can go write books, keynote, and I have a whole separate team that assists me with like my speaker business, even though it all rolls up to the same, it's, it, we sort of bifurcate it between my brand as an author speaker and the work that the consulting company can do. And they literally feed each other now. So we have a team of 25 people or so. Um, and yeah, we're, it's really, I think it's really working well. And I love, what I love about it is as a speaker and an author, you can plant a lot of seeds, but I love that we have a fulfillment mechanism where we can actually follow through and do the work that I'm talking about on the front end. Right. And to me, that feels like impact. You know, it's not right. just a shiny object. It's literally like, and, and we will roll up our sleeves and help you actually build yeah. this and make it happen. So a lot of consultants who are in a similar place, like their, you know, revenues are growing. Uh, they're feeling like they're starting to hit capacity but there's fear in terms of going out and, and bringing on new people, right? It's, mm -hmm. do I really have the ability? Is this going to be sustainable? There's lots of challenges that people have around building a team. Yeah. What have been some of the mm. you know, best practices or just if you were to give some advice to someone who is doing well, they, but they're getting to that place of capacity, uh, they want to hire someone or, or several people, but they don't actually know how to go about it or they're facing some fears. Like what, what advice might you offer someone in that position? Yeah, I think that a lot of founders, founderitis might be that you always have to be doing the work yourself and that you're a control freak. And that is not me, founderitis, I like but it, it's yeah. a ton, but it's yeah. a ton of founders. Um, I was lucky that I was kind of tired of the work a bit. Mm -hmm. Like I really did want to work on the business and um, grow it. Yeah. And um, other people were very happy to come under my banner and just do the work because they didn't want to sell the work. So it was this really nice synergy. And I think you just have to be honest with yourself. Like how, if you are going to grow your company bigger, it means you're going to have to take yourself out of the day to day. And some people would cry if you took the work away from them. I mean, literally that's like why they exist for me. Did, did you ever feel that like the, the revenue wasn't there to support hiring? Was that ever a place where it was like, yes. ah, God, do we hire this person? Do we, do we wait until we get a little bit higher? Like did that, <laughs> that conversation ever go on for you? Oh yeah. I mean, we've gone through, we went through the, like the recession in 2008. I had yeah. to literally like tuck my wings in, lay off most of the team and literally started to, had to like dial for dollars and deliver the work myself because I couldn't mm. afford anybody else. So I had to literally go back into the classroom, right. which, you know, was really hard and heartbreaking because you just don't expect that to happen, but you've got to maintain kind of a variable structure so that you can tuck in and God forbid, if we have another recession next year, 
you know, we may have to do, hopefully it doesn't get back to that point, but every time you go through these troughs and hills and valleys, you, I hope that you sort of maintain your basic infrastructure, but you should mm -hmm. always be planning. How could I make this company half the size it is like tomorrow if I had to? Like you, yeah. you always have to be ready for that. And my topic and field is so kind of discretionary. Like it's such a nice to have. Like I think a lot of businesses are like, you know, oh, well, we can do away with that or we can stop doing this for a while or whatever. So we're very, very subject to budgets and the economy and how comfortable people are, you know, with their jobs. Yeah. And so anyway, it's really scary. But I would say that's why you keep a 1099 portion of your team. And that's why you should always have a plan B to say, like, if I do need to get more hands on and I do need to do things myself, what would that look like? So I think that that actually that message um, it would resonate with a lot of people in terms of discretionary. So you're, you're playing in kind of the field of inclusive leaders, adversity. Um, others might be in different fields, but also that maybe their work, they it's not just like sales growth or cost reduction. It's not as, as hard. Right. Right. What have you found uh, is critical from a marketing or a messaging perspective that has just been most successful for you in terms of actually being able to, to win business, um, even though you're kind of dealing with something that is discretionary, that isn't maybe key to the growth mm -hmm. of the business, or at least top, not top of mind for a lot of leaders? Oh, it's so hard. Um, yeah, our field is really small, and I know all my competitors, <laughs> most of them. Um, I think it's look, I mean, maybe our differentiator is, um, it's not cost. I don't think it, I would say that I'd say, um, expertise and sort of the reputation that I have worked really hard. I mean, not every founder and company has books, right? So that's another way to kind of distinguish yourself, white papers, um, being quoted in major media or in like research papers, um, and having an amazing team that has a great reputation, which I think we do. And we've worked really hard to have is that precedes us. Um, I'm always speaking and people are like, oh, I saw her here and I saw her there and I heard her interview here and like having a podcast. I have one and I'm on them all the time. So we've really, really invested in getting the word out in multiple channels. Um, yeah. And I'm just Sounds lucky. Like thought I, leadership is very big for you. It's really big. I, I yeah. think that when you're selling people and knowledge and not widgets, you've got to create a reputation that's strong. And, um, and you, like I said earlier, you've got to give into the field. Like you you have to be a trailblazer. And so people look to us to say, hey, what's next? So we're writing about what's next all the time. We're sort of trying to document that. And I'm, you know, I'm weighing in. And I, I think thought leadership is, is critical for service-based businesses with, um, that are people at its core. I mean, all we are is what's in our heads and how we solve problems. That's, mm -hmm. that's our value proposition. And the other thing is how many companies you work with. I think leveraging your broad industry sort of know-how and what you've seen that is a lot of our currency is knowing how this is going to turn out like, at, you know, for your company, I saw it over here. Maybe you could try it here with some tweaks. It's that it's not book learning and it's not learning from a certificate program. It's literally like having seen things work out or not in the trenches mm. and understanding like, so if we um, take this and put it over here, because businesses are always leveraging best practices. I mean, that's like the whole thing. So you know, if you have a bird's eye view on that, I think it really builds your credibility because they're all at the end of the day, very competitive with each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when you're talking about right now, Jennifer, it sounds like you almost went from success to success in terms of thought leadership. But I think there's a lot of people might be in a position where they've gotten business coming in. They've never really had to go, you know, hunt for, for new opportunities. Mm. Like it's just been referrals of their network. Then they wake up one day and go, okay, I, I need to generate more business. My pipeline is drying up. Yeah. Uh, they look at content. They look at thought leadership. Uh, but they go, well, I keep hearing this stuff takes time. I don't know if I can, like, you know, should I be doing this? What, what was your experience? I mean, did, did you have any quick successes with thought leadership and content? Was it speaking or was there, you know, just any advice you'd offer to people like around the content and thought leadership? Yeah. Well, I always, I always say like, look, you could do a blog on medium, you know, it doesn't need to be in Forbes or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can always be writing about your experience and you can always, usually you can always tell even one successful story or successful implementation. If you can get the client to agree to tell it publicly, um, and run through all legal and whatever you need to do, um, you can still get it out there. Um, 
you can do you can do both you know self publish a book very early in the process i think books are really legitimize your message i mean i always say i'm the same consultant i always was but the book changed everything the book put us on the map it's something people can hold in their hands it can reach way more people than my talks or our workshops can right. um so it just really when you think about your social media outreach on LinkedIn, for example, tagging people in your industry to, to draw their attention to certain things that you write or in, maybe an interview that you did, um, just kind of, you know, I think you've got to be working all these channels because you don't want it to dry up. And I think what you've got to do is be investing even in flush times. Never assume that you can stop kind of feeding that front end of the pipeline and generating more more interest. I wouldn't say leads because leads are hard to get. I think you generate attention and interest and you add value and you sort of are this like consistent voice. And, you know, when somebody has an opportunity, they'll say, oh, I love, I've read everything Jennifer writes. Like, why don't we, t why don't we hire her? Or why don't, what about their team? And so it's really like that steady drip. Staying top of mind, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It's really that, important. I think that's so key. I mean, I, I say this a lot to, to our coaching clients. It's like, it's easy, especially when things are going well, to become complacent, right? Yeah, To just sure. be like, oh, I just need to deliver. I'm so busy. I don't need to market as much anymore. I've, I've gone beyond that. And then, of course, what ends up happening is, the pipeline does start to run dry. That's All right. those, like the seeds that you plant today often don't actually so, show results for three to six months so down true. the road. So you've got to always be planting the seeds consistently, right? So you can keep benefiting from them going forward. Uh, I have a note down here that between 2017 and 2018, your company grew by something like 70%. Um, <laughs> you can correct me if that's wrong, but I'm wondering if that is correct. Uh, what was the biggest, what kind of had the biggest impact on your growth during that time? Mm, I got a fabulous couple of new team members, I'd say, um, who just like a dedicated sales team is mm. huge. I yeah. mean, to be able to afford that is amazing. And I, I feel relieved because that was part of my job for many years, like back and forth. Right. So having like a, t a team and all they do is do proposals and RFPs. And I mean, literally, I, it's, it's a hard job for mm. sure. And it was a job that I did for a really long time. So I was right. really happy to have a team that could actually do it. Um, and so I'd say that that, and then the response to the 2016 election, I think, um, and a lot of things that happened subsequently has really galvanized corporate America to buy, to pay attention to this topic that we focus on. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I feel like it was kind of struggling to say how relevant it is and how, how present it is and what a problem it is for business. Yeah. Um, but I think now with also with millennials coming in in huge numbers in, the or in organizations, there's a, there's a tidal wave of expectation um, mm -hmm. that companies do this well and they know that they don't do it well. So who are they going to call? <laughs> so I think that that, and plus me having a book, honestly, first book and then a second book, which just came out um, in August of 2019, um, that also gave us a huge lift. I mean, we got in front of everybody. The podcast started two years ago. Um, I have 7,000 downloads every month, which may not seem like a lot for some people, but I, I'm thrilled with that. So again, it's that ramping up of the, the sales and marketing side that I was lucky enough to be able to do. And I've dug, I've dug deep. It's not like this was sort of excess cash that I've had lying around that I paid for this with. Like yeah. it is, so talk you know. Talk about, about the sales <laughs> side, especially, because I think a lot of people would love to, you know, they get to a, a level where uh, they've been generating all the sales themselves, but they, they want to go, they want to get more yeah. done, right? They want to kind of reach further. Um, and so hiring a salesperson for a lot of people is, is certainly a challenge, right? A lot of unknowns really hard. around compensation. W what are some of the lessons that you learned around like to start maybe when did you know it was the right time to hire a salesperson or a sales team? Yeah, I think there are creative ways you can structure a salesperson's comp so that the risk isn't so major, right? If you can find folks, well, first of all, if you can find practitioners that are also comfortable with selling, then you've got a nice hybrid model. So they can kind of sell the work, get a commission, and then do the work as well. Yeah. Um, that never really worked for me because in my experience, consultants and trainers don't love to sell. And they don't, they don't want that. They'd rather have somebody do it for them. Right. So again, that was like a perfect marriage. When I found out like that recipe, it really worked. Uh, but I would say that with sales, dedicated salespeople, um, industry background, um, contacts in the industry ideally mm -hmm. um you know culture fit it's very hard i failed over and over and over again with salespeople. um how many times and, how many times do you hire oh someone and have to 
I, I paid this one guy, like he was a chief diversity officer of a large company that I thought would be perfect at this because he had the Rolodex and whatever. Um, and I paid him tens of thousands of dollars for two months and I realized it was not working. Mm -hmm. He couldn't write an email. He was too used to having a um, assistant to do everything. So you got to, you got to find people that are scrappy, that don't have an ego about stuff that are willing to step in and do everything. They need to be workaholics in my book because I am. Um, and they also need to respect the brand. The other thing I've encountered is sometimes really talented salespeople would be building their own stuff on the side and kind of like kind of working across purposes with you. Yeah. So I, I also have encountered, I've had people steal clients from me. I've had, um, it's been really, and it's going to happen. Some of that's going to happen when you trust people to lead your business there's no way you can kind of protect yourself a hundred percent. You can have but all the even, contracts. Do you have like a kind of a non-compete or anything? I like do. That? I do. But it's, yeah. are you really going to go to court about right. this stuff to like fight for that client? Like yeah. realistically, I mean, you get $10,000 into legal, legal bills and like it becomes, it's just so painful. It's like, right. I can't, I just take it, just take the yeah. client. Um, and it was very heartbreaking because you trust people, you bring them into the fold and then yeah. they do that. And it, it sucks, honestly. Um, but I hope those days are behind me. I hope we have the kinds of controls in my business now where that's not going to happen. I have a very vigilant CFO, strategic <laughs> advisor, like, you know, everything goes through the senior team. So there's no funny business. There's no, like if, if, if somebody is pitching their own business at the same time as they're working on our business, like I'm going to know about it because we have those checks and balances. But I think when I was first building the company, I couldn't be everywhere at once and I didn't have people looking out for that side of the business and sort of making sure that everybody was behaving appropriately. And it's just very difficult. I mean, particularly I'm sending people on planes to go into classrooms, you know, and deliver our stuff. And it's, it's just been, I have held the vision, but I'll tell you, it has felt very risky what I've had to do in order to build my company to the point it is now. Yeah. Um, risky financially, I've made huge investments. Some have backfired, people have stolen clients. And yet, like now we are in this really, really knock on wood, great, great space where everything is finally working after about a decade. <laughs> and, and Jennifer, knowing what you know now, uh, you know, if you could go back in time, would you yeah. hire a salesperson earlier? Or do you believe that it, it was critical that you were doing the sales, that you were doing the market, you were kind of leading that up to get it to a certain point first. And that understanding is what ultimately led you to be able to get the right people in place. Yeah, I honestly did a ton of the work for years. Um, yeah. I didn't like it. And I think that it was a necessary evil in order to reach like the bigger vision, which was to have a bigger footprint right. and, and have a bigger um, impact, honestly, yeah. which is what gets me up in the morning. So, um, so I'd say, unfortunately or fortunately, it has to be you doing everything. I think for me, the easiest things to start to job out were the delivery piece, like is that I could feel like I could manage. But I, I think what I was at a deficit for is like not knowing what a good salesperson really looked like, like I, or not knowing what a good COO should be doing, um, or not knowing whether I have a good CFO or not. And as I started to build, I had to kind of, I had like lots of fits and starts with the wrong people. And then I think knowing when do you need to cut somebody loose because it's not working? Um, you know, how do you know when you're a new leader and you haven't been down this road before? How do you know when somebody's not the right fit? Because you just want them to work so badly. <laughs> so, and, and um, what have you found? Like, how have you gotten those answers? Is it just trial and error? <laughs> have you been reading books? Are you working with coaches and mentors, uh, tapping kind of your, your network and connections? Like, how have you been able to get answers to those questions? Yeah, it's, it's all those things you just said. It's, okay. It's trial and error. It's, yeah. um, it's trusting your gut. Like if your mm -hmm. gut is telling you that something's not right, but you really want to believe that it's right. I think you yeah. need to listen to your gut. Yeah. Um, you need an, a board of advisors that only has your best interests at heart. I would say that was like the biggest, and I don't know who those people would have been, mm -hmm. but I do think if you have the opportunity, get people that have your back that have been down the road before that really believe in you and your vision. Um, and who you can run like new hires by, you can run comp strategies by, you know, really think of it as the people who are going to keep you safe so that you don't make those costly mistakes. Um, make sure that it's not just your eyes that, that are seeing everything that you've got like several sort of points um, of review and, um, and, and listen to those folks. I think that that was, that would have probably helped me a lot, but um, what else did, how else did I learn? I, 
And with each person that was a failure, ultimately, I still learned a ton about what I really wanted versus what I didn't want. So I think over 10 years, you get kind of closer and closer to the ideal people. Um, and, and I'm not sure there's a shortcut for that, honestly. <laughs> there, there, there usually isn't, right? Shortcuts don't, don't no. usually exist to the degree people want them. Okay, two other quick questions for you. So you talked about brand briefly, but your company is called <clears throat> Jennifer Brown Consulting. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Some people advise against right, using your name yeah. in, business in case you want to sell it or exit the company. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's such a, I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> um, we've talked about that for many years and gotten mm -hmm. a lot of conflicting advice. Um, Accenture at one point was mentoring us as a company and said, you know, the Jennifer Brown name is where all the equity lives, like in the, in the marketplace. And so we were like, okay, well, let's keep the full name. We were, are referred to as JVC though, in sort of our casual uh, conversations and our work with clients. So I think at some point the that we may consider that name change to differentiate it and take the person out. But I'll tell you, many people ask me, don't people expect you to walk in the room when it's your company because your name is on the door? And we've actually transcended that. We, in fact, several years ago, more than several years ago, nobody really expects me to walk through the door. And the team is so great at saying like, here's what Jennifer does over here. Right. Here's what she costs. She's mostly keynoting, you know, if you have the kind of session that's appropriate for her, like, okay, let's talk about that. But really we have this amazing team and they're, they're expert at what they do. Yeah. And honestly, you can kind of get over it really fast. Mm -hmm. So I do mm -hmm. think that, um, and we have two different websites, interestingly too, we have Jennifer Brown speaks and Jennifer Brown consulting, um, Jennifer Brown speaks. We created when the book launched so that people have a separate place to kind of go. And my brand could be connected, but distinct. Right. Um, and I don't know future wise, I'm not sure if we'll conjoin them again, keep them separate, but, um, it enables me to have a bit of a different and a broader voice than just talking about the consulting we're doing all the time. Yeah. So I think that you, you have to play with this sort of, to, to, the, if you have multiple businesses and you're across them, um, you know, doing that brand analysis. And, um, I think, I think at some point we'll probably, we'll probably shift the name because I want the company to be able to stand on its own and I want it to have its own identity to a degree. And I want the consultants to be front and center and the stars of the show. Yeah. And I think that um, I am in service of them. Honestly, I feel that I'm all the work I do is to enable them to have as much work as they want so that they can go and do their goodness in the world. And I'm yeah. behind that. So so I have a different kind of mentality as a founder that I don't always have to be the top subject matter expert. And by the way, I've never been the, the only and the best. Like mm -hmm. my team knows so much more than I do and different and different. Yeah. Like, yeah. And they would solve problems differently than I would if I were the one in the classroom dealing with the client. So I love that. And I think that high trust you know, is something that probably a lot of founders are uncomfortable with. Um, and I'm also very much not a rubber stamp kind of boss to say, I want you to solve problems like in the way you would solve them, not in the way I would solve them because mm -hmm. there's no, in my work, it's Peter Block, right? There's like not really one answer. <laughs> it's a lot of different ways you could go. So, um, yeah. so I love that dynamic. I feel like I work for the team members and I'm out here trying to generate as much business as I can so that we can make more of an impact and we can have as many arms and legs um, as we possibly can so that we can influence the whole conversation, which is the there goal. Go. Fantastic. Well, you answered my second question, which, which is where should people go to learn more about you and your work, but is one of those websites better than the other? I mean, wh where should we direct people? We will link yeah. up both or kind of both URLs, but is there one that people should remember? Yeah. I mean, your audience is a lot of consultants building their own businesses. So they may be less interested in Jennifer Brown consulting because it's more of that. That's the B2B like mostly corporate, Right. Uh, website, right? It's like sort of okay. here's the team. Although, you, although I think people we're, we're going to link up both. Let's just make it easy. We're going to have yeah, a link Jennifer Brown totally. speaks and Jennifer Brown Consulting. Sure. Um, it'll be the full transcript, the show notes. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on. Really thank enjoyed the Thank you so much. I have enjoyed this a lot. Thanks for asking all these great questions. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Talk soon. Thank you.